deep in the night Your heart fills with dread Probably a murderer who wants you dead It could be a ghost, a demon or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed You'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Freaky Friday. It is Friday, May 17th, and by the time you're hearing this, we will have done our very first show of our Full Moon Energy Tour, and it was a hit in St. Louis. We know it went so well. St. Louis was great, wasn't it? And then tomorrow night, as you hear this, on May 18th, we're going to be in Chicago, and May 19th, we're going to be in Milwaukee. It's a Full Moon Weekend. It's going to be a ton of fun. I'm excited to have an extra day in there to do Chicago fun things, too. Always so fun. I hope it's still cool there. (laughs) Fingers crossed. It might be like where it's 75 and they're like, it's so hot. And we're like, okay, we'll take it. 75 is great. (laughs) Yeah, 75 sounds like a dream right now. Although today isn't that bad. But, um, you know, still not great. (laughs) I'm surprised it's not warmer because the sun is exploding right now. Like Uh There's like the massive solar coronal ejections that I keep seeing like – Normally, people on TikTok that I follow for storm stuff are like talking about the sun spot. The sun flares are bursting, and you might be able to see aurora borealis super far. So, if y'all have seen the northern lights down in like Missouri this week, send us a Freaky Friday message because the burst was supposed to allow you to see aurora borealis kind of all across the country. How are those two things correlated? And this, Uh, I uh, probably uh, sound ignorant, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I the only thing I vaguely understand is that I think that when the burst of energy comes from the sun, it mashes on whatever aurora borealis is and kind of like pizza dough. It Disperses smishes it, it further out. where the, further than what it would normally be, which is up at the top, at the, up at the top of the globe, you know, in your well, classroom. The if pointy you're in part. St. Louis, and you get to see this. Good for you because that sounds right. Going into like Alaska, somewhere where you really get yes. a good view and, and seeing that is a bucket list of mine, where it just looks like otherworldly, mm-hmm. just green and blues swirling in the sky. Take me, take me to the Northern Lights. Well, we're going to take you to lots of places on this Freaky Friday. We have uh, tales that span the globe. Well, we may not be going to the Northern Lights anytime soon, but we mm-hmm. are going to be heading to some fabulous cities. You're, we've already been to one and it was fantastic and <laughs> by the time you hear this. But like Heather said, for our full moon energy tour, St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, Charlotte, Raleigh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Toronto. I'm so excited to go back there. Kansas City, Oklahoma City, San Diego, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Dallas. For all the details, including dates, times, venues, and more, visit Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. And what show are we doing, Heather? We're doing that Full Moon Energy Tour. And if you want to know what Full Moon Energy is about, let me tell you, it's about taking up space. It's about being that thing that just drives people to the brink. And we're going to teach you (laughs) all about that and how the moon does that to us and how we can better encompass that by all of the mysterious, macabre, lore, creepy legends, conspiracies, all the weird stuff you like to hear us joke about. That's what we joke about, but it's all centered around the moon. So if you have a friend who's never heard the podcast before, doesn't know what the hell it is we do, it's a great way to bring him to the show because everybody loves the moon. We all live right underneath it. <laughs> yeah, we. everybody does. Lo- if anybody out to. there hates the moon, bring him. Off. We'll, tr- we'll, con- we'll convert him. We can, I yeah, promise. Yeah, I shouldn't have said fuck off. <laughs> bring him and then we'll convert him. They'll leave a lover. You'll leave a lover of the moon for sure. <laughs> Well, for now, we have some very freaky stories lined up for you today. So I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get freaky. This first one is from Kristen, and it is called A Dark and Rainy Night in Littleton. Hello, Sinisterhood has become one of my very favorite podcasts. Thank you so much for all the time and effort you put into creating a podcast that is not only entertaining, but you do a wonderful job of ensuring that each story is respectful. And I appreciate that very much. The story I would like to share takes place in early 2006 in New Zealand. I'll be changing the names of my friends I was traveling with as I've lost touch with them and didn't want to use their real names without permission. The details of this story are etched so deeply in my brain 
because so much of it is still a mystery to me. So let's get into it. I was living on the South Island of New Zealand, working with a nonprofit that, at the time, I believed was just doing good work in the community. Later in life, I would come to realize that I was living with a religious cult. This story is a perfect example of things that they would do and play off as, quote, normal. I was young and far too trusting, so I didn't question it at the time. And 18 years out, I'm glad to say that since that time, I've grown a good head on my shoulders. They wanted everyone to participate in what they called Faith Week. We could bring one backpack, one sandwich, no phones, and no money or credit or debit cards. And we got dropped off on the side of the road an hour from where we were living and just had to have faith we would be taken care of. We weren't allowed to go home for seven days. And then when we came back, we would all share these stories with each other. I was dropped off on the side of the road with John and Sarah. All three of us were from different parts of the United States, and we were a bit skeptical of how the week would go. Hitchhiking is, or at least it was in 2006, legal in New Zealand. So thumbs out, we were ready to find a ride. The first four days were actually pretty great. We met some awesome people who opened their homes to us. We were given wonderful places to stay. And one host had a party for us so his friends could meet the Americans in town. As the week was winding down, we decided to head to a little peninsula off of the city we were most familiar with. The only way to get there is through a mile-long tunnel that goes through a mountain, and you can't walk or hitchhike through it. We ended up each using some money a new friend had given us to buy bus tickets into Littleton. When we got there, it was dusk. There had been two other people on the bus with us, who got off and went their separate ways, and we decided to walk around the small harbor town to get our bearings before finding a place to stay. As we turned the corner, we saw a man that was on the bus with us who waved as we walked by. We realized quickly that finding somewhere to stay in Littleton was going to be a challenge. It was getting darker quickly, and it was starting to lightly rain. There was no one to be seen in town. When we turned a corner again, we saw the same man from the bus walking towards us. As he approached, he slowed and asked us if we needed any help. We quickly explained what we were doing and how we had ended up in Littleton and asked if he had any ideas of where we could stay. I wish that I could offer for you to stay at my place, he responded, but my wife's family is in town visiting, so we have a full house. You should try the church down the street. Maybe the priest is there and will let you stay. Thanking him, we headed to the church a few doors down and across the street. We knocked on the door several times and peered in the window, but it was clear that the building was empty. Turning around, we saw that there was some kind of a school building that had awnings over the walkways, so we crossed the street to walk up the steps so that we could stay dry under the awnings. We talked for a couple of minutes about our options before hearing a rustling to our left. We looked up and saw the man from the bus standing by the tree line of some dense woods, waving at us. Our first instinct was to be completely creeped out. How had he gotten behind us without us seeing? And why did it look like he came out of the woods, especially now that it was fully dark outside? He approached us and said that he spoke with his wife, and they decided we could stay with them. They didn't want us being stuck out in the rain all night. Reluctantly, we agreed, as we didn't want to be stuck out in the rain all night either. We walked down the steps to the sidewalk, and he turned right, walking up the steps to the house directly next door to the school. So why had he come out of the woods on the opposite side of the building? It was a large Victorian-style house with a big front porch. It was about 9 p.m., and the house was dark, except for one light on in the living room. When we walked inside, we all set our bags down and looked towards each other. The house was eerily silent, which is not what we expected after being told that we couldn't stay there since they had a full house. There was a small rocking horse next to the couch in the living room, a desk with a desktop computer in the corner, and a small hallway that led into a dark kitchen. There were two doors in the hallway, I saw one door crack open about an inch, and the face of a woman looked out, before the door quickly shut. She said nothing, and we never heard another sound from her. "'May I offer you some dinner?' 
I apologize. The kitchen is a mess. I'm always busy with my work, and my wife was busy with our toddler all day, so the dishes piled up, the man said. The sink was overflowing with dishes. We politely told him not to worry and happily accepted a small meal. He then said, you know, you should all take showers tonight. Here in New Zealand, there's not a lot of hot water in the mornings, so it would be better if you showered tonight. We politely declined the offer, and I looked to Sarah to see that she was physically shaking in fear. John, who was trained in the military, was suddenly on high alert and stood in front of Sarah and I. We had been living in New Zealand for several months at this point, and we lived in a small community with four houses that housed about 40 people. We never ran out of hot water in the mornings. Are you sure? The man asked again. If you don't shower tonight, you aren't going to be able to shower in the morning. We're sure, John replied matter-of-factly, before asking, Is there anything that we can do to help you? We're grateful that we have a place to stay, and we would be happy to help out around the house before we leave in the morning. Or if there's yard work we can do tomorrow before we head out? The man just shook his head no, and turned around to walk back to the kitchen. John turned to us. Something weird is going on, he said. I want you two to get some sleep tonight. I'm going to stay awake and make sure nothing happens. I reluctantly nodded my head, and Sarah sat, shaking, unable to speak. The man entered the room again, maintaining his emotionless demeanor as he interacted with us. Sarah and I were sitting near our bags on the living room floor at this point, John standing in front of us. The man stood in the doorway of the kitchen, leaning against the wall as he looked at us. I thought of something you could help with, he said, his voice and facial expression stoic, with an emotionless grin on his face. Sure, John answered. How can we help you? Well, you see, he began, the emotionless grin remaining. I'm a therapist, and I have this client. You can pray for him. Okay, said John. What's his name? Oh, I can't tell you that. It's confidential. But my name is Michael. You can just pray for Michael's client. Okay, Michael, is there anything specific you would like us to pray for? John prodded. Well, Michael began, staring past us out the front window of the house. You see, Michael said as he made eye contact with John, he killed someone, my client, and he just can't forgive himself for it. As Michael paused, the house was completely silent. All I could hear was my heart beating in my ears. It was like the air was electric. I looked over to see Sarah had taken out a notebook and pen. She wrote something and slid it to me. I think that it said, we need to leave. But she was shaking so badly that it was hard to read what she wrote. Michael continued, talking slowly and looking menacingly out the window. Everyone thinks he's a monster, but he's just a scared little kid inside. That emotionless grin was back on his face as he stood in the doorway staring at us. He slowly made eye contact with each of us, then said, Not the kind of guy you would want to run into on a rainy night in Littleton. Oh my God, I thought. We were going to be murdered in Littleton. Okay, John began. We can do that. It was silent. And slowly, we began to hear pings of large raindrops hitting the tin roof of the house. As the rain escalated, the sound got louder and louder as our eyes got wider and wider. There was a pit in my stomach, and at this point, you could physically see Sarah's entire body shaking. Hey, Michael said, looking around John to Sarah and myself. Have you ever seen the last Lord of the Rings movie? I nodded my head yes, watching John do the same. Michael continued, You know that part of the movie where the army is all standing in their armor, waiting for the battle to begin, and it's almost silent? All you can hear is the sound of the raindrops hitting their armor? We all nodded that yes, we did in fact remember that scene, as we listened to the pouring rain outside. Michael was looking past us again out the window, and a wide grin spread across his face, before his eyes shifted quickly to make eye contact once more, saying, Sends chills down your spine, doesn't it? And with that, he quickly turned and walked down the hallway towards the kitchen. 
John turned to us quickly. Get your bags, put on your coats, and wait for me by the front door. We are not staying here. Sarah and I scrambled to collect our things and heard John call down the hallway to Michael. Hey, so sorry. We decided to move on for the night, but we will pray for your client. As John was zipping his jacket, Michael appeared in the doorway once more. Are you sure? He said. You can stay and shower. You won't be able to shower in the morning. We're sure, John stated, as he continued to stand between Michael and myself and Sarah. Well, okay, Michael said, an air of frustration in his voice. But if you leave and that door closes behind you, you can't come back. We understand, John quickly replied. Thank you for everything. With that, I grabbed the handle for the front door, and the three of us piled onto the front porch. As soon as the door clicked shut, the three of us ran. With pure adrenaline fueling us, we ran through the entire town to the tunnel. John busted into a bar on the corner and begged a woman that was about to leave to drive us through the tunnel to the bigger city. To this day, I don't know how we convinced her to let the three of us in her car at 11 p.m., but after getting dropped off on the other side of the tunnel... We walked for several hours until we had to stop out of pure exhaustion. We slept on the grass in front of the Salvation Army for a few hours. Right after we'd fallen asleep, a drunk driver crashed through the gate and came within several feet of running us over. The car still worked, and the driver, without even noticing us, just backed up and drove off again. We called the leader of our program the next morning and told them we were coming home two days early and someone needed to come pick us up from the city. They reluctantly agreed, and lo and behold, we were the last set of people from this religious cult that ever participated in Faith Week. I guess once you almost get several members murdered in the city, you reevaluate what's important. To this day, I have no clue who Michael really was. Going on my instincts that night... Michael isn't a therapist. I think Michael is that monster who's really a scared little kid inside. Who knows why he wanted us to shower so badly, but I'm happy we didn't stick around to find out. I've tried Googling everything I can think of, but I've never gotten any closer to knowing just how much danger I was in that night. I wish that I still had the pictures that I took of Sarah's handwritten note saying we should leave, but it's lost on an old hard drive from the laptops of yesteryear. What I do know is that I'm certain this is the only time in my life I've come that close to dying, not once, but twice in one night. Looking forward to seeing you both in Cleveland this summer. Until then, keep it creepy, Kristen. Uh, Kristen, I think you survived a horror film is what Dude. it sounds like. Like, I mean, I could very well written. I could picture the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, I was just saying before we started recording, Horror movies in, like, New Zealand and Australia, they just hit different, and this feels like one. And I don't know why he wanted you to shower so badly Mm-mm. either, but I'm um, you, you did right by not finding out. <laughs> yes. If an odd expression and an odd person's like, take your clothes off and shower in the night, the water will be gone in the morning. That's just like, I'd rather stink. I'd rather stink so much. I mm-hmm. want to stink so much than shower in your house. I'll never that's... shower again than yeah. shower in the... Especially... <laughs> The whole setup, him in the tree line waving at you, yeah. and then the house is right there, and then just like the solitary rocking chair in Mm-mm. a dark house that the family is supposed yeah. to be in. My Where's wife's the family? family. Mm-mm. He's like, they're all staying here under the baseboards where I buried them. <laughs> <laughs> they're in the attic. Don't go up there. They've been here for, ooh, I don't know how long now. 30 it's, years. It's just all grandma skeletons, like dude, fucking psycho. Psycho, yeah. It's, uh, and what was that woman doing in the bedroom? Like, no, just peeking out no, she knew Yikes. what he wanted to do she knew what michael was gonna do he had some killing plans he's just a boy he's just a frightened child let him play play with michael i'm not playing with oh. michael i'm not playing with any of that y'all made the right move john being like you know what hey we're gonna pray for your client man mm-hmm. it was good to meet you guys we'll see y'all later <laughs> just john get the fuck is out. who you need in one of these situations because you either fight flight freeze maybe appease and he was like He knew how to keep it calm, collected, like protect, but also, you know, appease. So it wasn't like we're calling you out on anything. We're just going to get the fuck out of there. And that Mm -hmm. you did. And good for you because, 
I don't think that that night would have gone that well, and I'm glad that you were able to leave so easily. Yeah, he uh, what do you, we got to call it? Protect, deflect, and hit the hit the bricks. Hit the like, deck. Hit the deck. I was to say hit the deck usually <laughs> means duck, but hit the bricks. Like just leave. Just like oh my gosh, that's, I'm gonna stand between you. But that's so nice of you. Thank you. Yeah. We're gonna just go this way. Thank you very much. Damn. That's just yeah. That's what a especially at such a remote place that's really hard to get to and from. Like you can't mm-hmm. walk there. You can't take. You have to have a car when you don't have a car. And yeah, it sounds like the people that ran Faith Week were like, ah, oh, well, we got another one that almost got picked up by a serial killer. Guess we have to stop doing that. Yeah, I don't love, like, we're just going to drop you off with barely any food and not really anything and just, quote, you got to have faith you're going to make it out. Well, sometimes that's not enough, and we got to have Mm-hmm. We need something more. Luckily, you had somebody that was military trained that was like, not on my watch. Yeah. And whoever that shout out to the lady who was like, all right, yeah, get in the car. I'll give you a ride <laughs> okay. of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for sending that in. And we're glad that you made it out of there a lot. Narrow, narrow escape. <laughs> Sinisterhood will be right back. Oh, well, I tell you what, if I have to shave my legs, I want them to, I don't want it to hurt. I don't want it to be a bloody situation. I don't want it to be messy. And that's how I know it's summertime and I'm happy to see a razor if it's an Athena Club razor. That's, I'm fine with an Athena Club. You got to step up your game, especially now that we're coming out of pants season Mm -hmm. some you know if you want your legs to be silky smooth the best way to do that was with athena club's award-winning razor kit it is seriously the best on the market heather and i both use them Mm -hmm. have exclusively for over a year now i won't go back i can't go back. no i refuse i'll (laughs) never come back (laughs) absolutely not there's a reason too the athena club razor kit first of all it's an absolute steal at just 10 bucks it comes with a beautifully made ergonomic handle two super sharp razor heads that deliver an incredibly smooth shave every time. It just makes you feel juicy. It's great. You also get a game-changing magnetic hook with the razor kit so it easily stores your stuff so it doesn't get all gooey and gross on the side of your tub or falls down or smashes or comes apart. Blammo, it's right there, right on the wall. We love it. Yes, also little hands can't get to it as easily Mm -hmm. as if it's just sitting down because little little tiny fingers on little Oof. tiny rays you know they want to touch good. it and see and then it's Away. no good so you got to put it up there on the little the little hook hangy thingy also the quality of the shave the just the razor glides effortlessly thanks to those five precision engineered blades the blades are perfectly spaced out to let hair pass through with each stroke and you'll experience less irritation which is always a win in my book. I also don't think I've ever had a multitasking razor, Mm -hmm. but this one moisturizes while you shave with an avocado oil and hyaluronic acid serum. Plus it has built in skin guards that help to prevent razor burn. This thing is like, I tell you, it's just, yeah, it's like the best coworker you have. It's just multitasking on all fronts. It puts us all to shame and you never have to worry about dull blades because you get refill scent on your schedule. You just tell them how often you want fresh blades. Athena Club will send them automatically with free shipping. So you always have the best blades for the best shave experience for yourself. So if we've been singing its praises, but until you feel that juicy skin under your hand and how <laughs> like moisturized it's been, you just won't know. So if you're ready to upgrade your shaving experience, switch to the best razor on the market and show your skin you care with Athena Club. Head over to athenaclub.com to try their award-winning razor and body products and get 20% off your purchase with code CREEPY at checkout. You can also find Athena Club razors at your local Target store. Trust us, you won't look back. Happy shaving! This next one is from Brenna, and it is called Dad Might Have Pissed Off the Mob. Hello, I've been listening to your podcast for a little over a year now, and I'm still catching up on episodes, but I love the energy you both bring to the podcast. After listening to a lot of listener stories, I wanted to write in about some of the weird, true crime-like things I've experienced in my life. But I'll start off with this one in this submission. For some brief context to this story, I live in Ohio, and a majority of my life was spent here, even though I was born in Texas. My dad was in the Air Force, and thankfully... I only had to move once when I was younger, since they really wanted him to stay in Ohio. Have you ever had a memory that you were not sure if it was an actual memory or a fever dream? Because this story was a situation like that. 
but I confirmed it with my dad, and I was not losing my mind. I mentioned my dad was in the Air Force, but he retired after 20 years, and after that he went on to do so many different jobs, I don't remember his job title exactly when this happened, but I believe he was a civilian contractor for the Air Force that oversaw many different projects. One day, my dad came home from work. He had talked with my mom on the phone beforehand about the situation, but then let the three kids still in the house know what was going on. He told us to be extra careful and to keep an eye out whenever we went out. Me being in, I want to say, 7th or 8th grade, maybe like 13 to 14 years old, tried to get more information because anxiety and never really got one right away. It wasn't until a few days later of bugging my parents, because I needed to know what I needed to be on the lookout for, that I found out my dad might have pissed off the mob. I know that sounds so freaking crazy, especially since this was Ohio. I did not question this as a kid. Rather, I was extra paranoid and kept an eye out. I remember at one point looking under my parents' cars for explosives. In defense of my younger self, all I knew about the mob was from movies or fiction books. So I was paranoid for about a year and then stopped because I probably moved on to something else or my parents might have said we were fine. Well, I finally asked my dad about this at 29 years old because I happened to remember and had to make sure it was not some crazy fever dream. My dad explained to me that it was true and he was working on some project for work that involved a construction crew, but they were doing illegal activities and overall, just sketchy things. He also mentioned that it seemed like the construction manager was in charge of everything, and not the program manager that was supposed to be in charge. My dad called them out on the illegal activities and really pissed off the construction crew. He then had a really bad feeling and called my mom and explained what happened. He had a gut feeling to be extra careful and said that if something ever happened to him, it would be the construction guy, and gave my mom his name. He never confirmed it was the mob, but he said based on everything he saw and experienced, it felt and looked like the mob. He would take different routes home and had a document of the activities just in case something happened to him so my mom could use it if needed to get the guy. Turns out, a few months later, the construction crew was forced to dissolve due to the illegal activities, and my dad never heard from them or saw them again. He has kept the documents all these years just in case. This very much helps explain my overall paranoia in life. I already had the anxiety. Thank you for reading this, and if I hear it on the podcast, I will squeal like a child with joy. I hope the Texas summer is not too brutal this year and that your AC continues to work. Well, I'll take those blessings. Thank you, Brenna. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Wow. Your dad was ready to turn states with this, man. He's like, <laughs> keep them, babe. Get the filing cabinet. Put this in the fire safe. I need these it's always in. construction. It is. Waste yeah. management yeah. is a big one. Something like that. Yeah, where it's like you kind of figure out a way to get a company to pay another company that pays a guy who pays a mm – -hmm. I don't know how it all works, but – when you I'll uncover I've something going from the Sopranos, that's like oh, yeah. my knowledge of, or and also Godfather, everything. Don't feel Jimmy bad. Hoffa, right now. Paris All of is my just in there, huh? Paris is just in there watching a thing about Jimmy Hoffa. I was like, what is this? All of my stuff, Brenna, that I know is largely from movies and books as well about the mob. So, oh yeah, yeah. Don't the, feel uh, bad about that. Untouchables. Yeah. I hate that you were having to look under your parents' car so for <laughs> explosives. Poor little thing, but. Luckily, everything worked out, but your dad was right. He had, uh, he knew something was going on. He freaking spotted it. That is a scary position to be in when you're like, I value my position, like, as, you know, as a civilian contractor with the Air Force, and now I have stumbled onto something illegal, and mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to be a whistleblower, a witness, whatever, but like, I'm not going to join the mob, so I got to take sides here. It's like, you know, your average guy just going to work, not realizing you're going to uncover some, like, mob conspiracy. But that you're right. It's it's hard for a little kid to be, like, worried about just little kid things because childhood in general is just a lot. But then to also be like, and also I'm like Elliot Ness. I'm worried. Got to check the car before me. we get in. Yeah. yeah. It's an added layer of stress you can't explain to the school guidance counselor easily. Right. <laughs> Well, Brenna, we're very glad that your family stayed yeah. safe and that your dad stuck to his guns. He Fuck was yeah. like, I'm not going to get all messed up in this illegal stuff. I'm going to I'm going to stay ethical. Good for right. you. Keep it on the up and up. And you know what? Keep receipts. We love to see it. Oh, yes. Well, this next one is from B. 
and it is called It's Raining Concrete. Hey ladies, I'm a new listener as of a couple weeks ago. You two rock. I'd forgotten about this story until listening to one of the recent Freaky Friday episodes, which was filled with experiences of close calls. While my experience doesn't quite measure up to the scale of those who almost boarded a missing flight or just barely missed a terrorist attack, it still reminds me of how easily life could change. When I was around 18 months old and obliviously enjoying my final months as an only child, my mom took me to a nearby mall to run some errands and bond with her favorite child. This mall is very unique. It's on the older side and built in sections, so to go from one side to the other, you have to exit one building and cross a small street. During this time, it was also undergoing heavy renovation, which made the environment noisy and dusty. My mom decided to brave the ruckus since this mall was the only one in the area that had a Pottery Barn kids, and she liked to show me the fun toys while shopping for my room. Mom was making her way to the store and wandering the nearby shops when she came onto the sidewalk that would take you to the other side of the mall. A large section filled with various construction material was blocked off by orange cones, so she pushed the stroller carrying me onto the road, around the pile, and back onto the sidewalk. No sooner had my stroller hit the sidewalk than we heard a resounding BOOM fill the air. Mom turned around to see a massive block of concrete hit the road exactly where we'd been walking just seconds before. She looked up to see a construction worker on the roof with the most terrified expression on his face. Being the unbothered queen that she is, my mom smiled at the man and kept right on walking to PBK, trying not to think about the fact that she and her baby could have been turned into mush if the block had landed sooner. The theory goes that the construction worker had tossed the block off the roof, thinking that it would land in the pile below, but overshot and just chucked the thing right into the road. I'm unbelievably grateful that I'm still here and that my sweet mom wasn't hurt either, but I can't... I'm unbelievably grateful that I'm still here and that my sweet mom wasn't hurt either, but I can't think too much about this story before my head starts spinning. What if I'd been killed? What if the block had pinned one of us to the ground? What if we'd witnessed someone else being struck by the block? It could have hit a car. Truly, we were fortunate enough to get the absolute best case scenario. An undeterred mom and an oblivious baby, along with a scarred construction worker who probably never acted impulsively again, I hope. It still amazes me that no one got hurt. When I talked to my mom about this story to get the details right, she said, Oh yeah, I went to that mall yesterday. I, however, have not been back since I can remember. Stay safe and invest in a heavy-duty stroller. Thanks for reading my story. That is like a scene from a cartoon with like an anvil or a piano just falling. That's horrifying. Yeah. Uh, This is, these kind of freak accidents are, oh, they get me because it's just like, you're just living your life and boom, like out of nowhere, you know, you don't even see it coming and construction stuff. Mm -hmm. I've stumbled upon some stuff on the internet. I wish I could take back. And it's just like, it's horrible, but you got around just in time and I, long to be as unbothered as your mother because <laughs> i would not have had that reaction <laughs> be like she scaled the side of the building like king kong and took that guy in her hand and choked him <laughs> no joke yeah. though that's like that's a sign though of maybe like uh eh, 20 30 years ago however long ago this was that it was like hey man accidents happened <laughs> yeah it's like but also that you're like oh i'm Five stories up, and I'm just going to chuck a huge piece of Let's concrete over the side? No. Mm-hmm. No, you need a basket, a collection basket up at the top, yeah. and then, like, a hoist or a lift to take them all down. Let's not just, just with reckless abandon, sort of fling large, dangerous mm-hmm. things. Like I said, an anvil, a piano situation, anything like that of falling stuff really does. Like you said, those freak accidents, and I'm with you, B. You can't really think too much about it. It's like, no. there's, yeah. But that kind of the idea of quantum quantum immortality is that in some strange universe you did get flattened like a pancake and that split you off into this universe that you're living in now so isn't that weird yeah b why don't you chew on that for a bit send that (laughs) to your mom (laughs) see what she's got to say about that 
<laughs> her mom was like, I don't know, maybe. Anyway, there was a great sale at Barn Kids. Bar <laughs> yeah, the fact that she can go back there. It. But you know what? You got to – sometimes like that's the it. best way to get over it is just to confront it head on. But She's like, I won't be stopped. <laughs> that is a moment, though – a very big teaching moment for that construction worker. And I hope that he did look down and see yes. what could have been or maybe what was in some other parallel <laughs> universe. And then was like, oh, collection basket. All right, yes. team meeting. We got to get a collection basket from now on. Yeah, I hope his stomach fell right out of his ass. And he was like, never again. And now every yeah. work site he's on, he's like, I'm going to tell you something about throwing things over the edge. Mm-hmm. One time, came this close, smashing a little baby and a lady. And I didn't do it because I just so happened. I wiped my nose on my shirt right before I threw it. If I hadn't have wiped my nose, it would have happened. In some <laughs> universe, I think I didn't wipe my nose. <laughs> I think things are different. <laughs> anyway, so before every construction site, he really, I think, t- so it was a teaching moment. B, he for, saved for countless this man. lives. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> You're near miss. Yes. <laughs> near miss saved countless other people's lives. Well, thank you, B, for sending that one in. Sinisterhood will be right back. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. Christy, if I said when we're gone on tour, aside from your children and aside from <laughs> your family, what is the number one thing that you miss when we travel? And I think our answer would be the same. It is. It's the mattress. It's we the we've been in a lot of hotels, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all over the board of how you would rate them. And honestly, the Helix mattress is always more comfortable than any hotel mattress we've ever come upon. We don't even stay in like five star hotels, but the times in my life, like when I back to when I worked at the law firm, I could stay at like this really swanky hotels. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. Helix sleep. It blows them out of the water every time. It's better. Yeah. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers and a mattress made just for kids. Ella has one. We love it. It's very comfortable for us to lay on with her at night. Also, it comes with those two pillows that are just the the Mm -hmm. best pillows I've ever had. And she loves the pillows, too. Helix knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. That's why they offer a 100-night trial and a 10- to 15-year warranty for you and your child to try out your new Helix mattresses. Every body is unique. So whether you're a side, back, stomach sleeper, maybe you're all of the above, Helix offers the mattress for you. Plus, they have enhanced cooling features that help regulate your body temperature no matter what the season, which couldn't be more invaluable to us especially as the summer starts to heat up yes get you one and never wake up in a pool of sweat again (laughs) like i used to and plus the setup is so fast and easy the mattresses are delivered in a box straight to your door for free by supporting helix you're allowing them to support us and our show so we all win helix is offering 20 percent of all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners go to helixsleep.com slash creepy and use code helixpartner20 This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Well, this next one is from Liz, and the subject line is, the time my car got broken into, and I sounded like the one police should be more concerned about. Hello, your whole team is amazing. I love getting to tune in weekly to hear my friends talk about anything and everything. Thank you for that. About six months ago, a rash of car break-ins started happening all around my city. A car would slowly drive down the street while three or four people would run from driveway to driveway looking for any unlocked car and taking whatever they could quickly get out of the car. Admittedly, I had been pretty lazy about locking my car because nothing ever really happens in my neighborhood. Famous last words. I get up for work pretty early, so I didn't think much of finding some random items on my driveway. I thought I had been pretty messy somehow coming home from work the night before, gathered them up, and just went about my drive to work. About halfway there, I noticed that the inside of my car was also a mess, and many items were missing. My garage door opener had also been thrown in the back, but somehow I just continued driving. Forgive me, it was like 5 a.m. Eventually, I noticed a lot was missing and ended up turning around and calling to report a car break-in. When I explained to the operator what had been stolen, they sent an officer out. Then I had to explain to the officer that a dagger, a hatchet... (laughs) A machete and an axe were among the stolen items. All in all, about $600 worth of items. As the officer continued to look around my car, he then found the remaining two machetes and the other knives. I was nervously trying to explain my job, forestry, 
and how I actually use all of these things in a legitimate manner, but you could see the look of confusion about the (laughs) excess of pointy things in my car. I get it. I probably looked insane at this point. After all the police activity died down, my neighbor came over to ask about what had happened. Apparently, that same night, their car had been broken into. There was nothing to steal, but their garage door opener was out. Two men had used it to actually go into their garage at 6.45 in the evening, but were scared off when the homeowners went in there. Which made me remember the odd placement of my opener. Luckily for me, my opener really sucks. You have to jam it about 40 times and line it up exactly right for it to actually work. Turns out that about an hour after my neighbor's break-in, another neighbor about a mile away from us had about 10 cars that were vandalized, with broken windows and damage to the cars. Nothing was taken from those. The cars were just smashed up. The reporting officer contacted me to mention that he thought it was likely done with my missing hatchet. At the end of all this, my car was fingerprinted. My neighbors refused to file a break-in report. None of my items have been recovered. A bunch of cars were senselessly damaged. And I finally learned to just lock my car. On a list of top 10 things you don't want to have to report was stolen. Um, Hatchet, multiple knives, axe, or I've got to be up. You're missing duct tape, machete, rope, (laughs) ski mask. Like It's like, hey, I swear it's all for work. I promise you. (laughs) Yes. I work in an interesting field. It gets cold out there. That's why I also need the ski mask. Yeah, it's definitely a thing to have to call at like 5 a.m. of like, my hatchets are gone. (laughs) And then you find out they were using another crime. Man, Liz lost her hatchets and some motherfuckers took them and just went on a hatcheting joyride. People that break into cars like this, there's a special place. And if there's a hell, that place for you. Because it's just senseless. You don't need any of this shit. Mm -mm. You know, it's just like doing stuff to be messy and to cause problems. And you don't realize like how that can really mess up somebody's whole, not just their day, but like every, like we talked about in the Mm -hmm. last weeks, like you could lose your job because you didn't get to get there mm-hmm. on time because you've got to report this and all this stuff. Plus, you don't want just anybody running around with a hatchet. Yeah. If you have a dagger, a hatchet, a machete, and an axe out in the wild, that is nerve-wracking. But I think you're right, Liz. If you're like, I live in like a rural place. Like, no one's going to come by at like 5 a.m. and bust in my car. But that's just when the Kia boys strike. Oh, yeah. The Kia boys. We heard from another listener. It was a very short one. But um, that she lives in the area where that's happening and mm-hmm. her son has a Kia and they won't give her insurance. <gasps> they, she can't get insurance for it because like, wow. I guess it's like when I lived in Florida and I tried to get insurance after a hurricane no. warning was issued. And they're like, you got to do this beforehand. <laughs> we don't let you <laughs> do this after now that you think there's a threat. But the Kia boys are real, man. Man. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Like you said, it's just crime for crime's sake. Just busting up a Mm -hmm. bunch of cars for no reason, costing everybody else money. That's how you know you go from, like, the cool kid in the streets to the old person. Like, my insurance rates are going to go up. (laughs) Stop stealing things, kids. Mm -hmm. But truly, that is where my mind goes. But I'm glad uh, nothing worse than just some smash windows happen with your hatchet, Liz. But what a pain in the ass, man. And having to have a cop look at you like, um... I'll be right back. I'm just going <laughs> to run some things past my supervisor. You're like, yes, yes. Look on me in fear. Do it. <laughs> well, thank you, Liz. Sinister Hood will be right back. Well, this next one is from Liv, and the subject line is Bigfoot Next Door. Another one. They're coming in like hot yes. now. <laughs> you guys are making my dreams come true. Liv writes. Hi, ladies. You said you couldn't have too many Bigfoot stories, so here's mine. I come from a family of Bigfoot enthusiasts. We've all seen the Bigfoot shows and read many cryptid and creepy books. I call my place Bigfoot Creek Farm, where a Bigfoot cutout roams the property and the egg cartons come decorated with a hand-painted Bigfoot. We love the guy. Recently, my parents were on vacation and made friends with the people staying near them. They were retired professors. The man was some sort of science professor, I think, physics or chemistry. He's very proud of this story and told my parents to, quote, tell everyone. (laughs) Many years ago, I think the 80s or 90s, the man, we'll call him the professor, was teaching at a school on a Native American reservation in Washington. He had a long commute to the school from the local town he lived in. 
He described it as driving down one mountain, through a valley, and up another mountain. He'd been working at the school for a while and had a good relationship with the people on the reservation. One morning, on his way to work, he was passing over a bridge in the valley. As he came up, he saw a large man standing on the side of the road. The professor slowed down and made eye contact with the man. He said the man was huge, broad shoulders, extremely tall, and hairy. He was naked except for a loincloth-like item around his waist. After a quick glance of eye contact, this mystery man simply stepped over the guardrail and disappeared into the woods. The professor arrived at the school, still not believing what he had seen. It wasn't an ordinary man. It wasn't just a large, burly guy roughing it in the woods. It was something, or someone, that the professor had never seen before. The professor spoke with some of the people on the reservation about what he'd seen. Everyone knew of the man, or men, that roamed the woods near them. It was understood that they left each other alone and stayed in their own areas. That's how it had always been. As the professor described this to my parents, he explained that it seemed that the tribe he had worked with treated these large men as a neighboring tribe, not interacting much, just aware that the other existed nearby. No negative interactions. A while later, on the same drive into school, the professor had the same experience again in almost the exact same spot. He came down into the valley and saw the large man near the road. As the professor approached, the large man simply disappeared into the woods. He only taught at the tribe school for a few years before moving away. He only had these two interactions with what he thinks was Bigfoot. What do you ladies think? Is there a group of Bigfoots living amongst us in the woods of Washington? Is Bigfoot more of a giant man, some furry bear-like monster? Is the professor just using his credibility as a doctor of science to fool everyone he meets? My family believes him and wants to believe even more in a whole tribe of respectable Bigfoots living peacefully in the woods of Washington. I, unfortunately, do not have photo proof of the Bigfoot tribe, but I've included some pictures of my personal Bigfoot in his Christmas attire, protecting the chicken coop and being the face of my farm. Well, thank you so much for the pictures. We love uh, we love a Bigfoot Creek farm. And oh, yeah. yeah, you got to spruce them up at Christmas time. All I the like holidays, it. really. <laughs> yeah, I like a shining lit Bigfoot. Well, that is fascinating to think of them as a, in a loincloth and somewhat, it's like a um, humanoid, which is what we hear. Not like full on mm-hmm. animal, not like it's a person who, but it's kind of like a like understanding and enough of like you're putting some clothes on Mm -hmm. yeah like maybe um more caveman era like Mm -hmm. just uh you know not not quite as evolved as we are now but what i really love is that you're like this these native americans are like you know what they keep to themselves we do our thing and we're all just gonna coexist and live in harmony we don't need to go over there and poke the bear and try and run them off or anything. And that's how we should all be, right? Coexist in a more peaceful way and not mm-hmm. a way of like, we got to get over there and see what the Bigfoots is up to. Yeah, just kind of uh, they do their thing. We do our thing and never the twain shall meet. And that's okay. So the professor, maybe he was peeking, driving in places he shouldn't have been. And the Bigfoot's like, what are you, what are you doing over there? <laughs> Wait, what, what's up? What's up, man? Are you on your way to, are you going to work? What are you doing? <laughs> I like that Liv calls them Bigfoots. Yes. But then last week we had Big Feet. Question mark. So wait in. It in. Is yeah. a group of Bigfoot just Bigfoots? Big yes. Feet? Or a, a whole other, you know, a gaggle? A murder <laughs> of Bigfoots? Yeah, we need you all to decide. I think once and for all, and then we'll submit it to <laughs> Merriam-Webster and we'll get it in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the official- we'll, get, we'll get them on the phone. Official pluralness. Well, thank you very much, Liv, for sharing that. And I, I agree with your family, I believe. You know, there's no reason for you to go, hey, uh, what, uh, it's good to meet you guys. Where are you from? Oh, okay, cool. You know what? I used to live in Washington State. You want to see, <laughs> hear a story about the time I saw a Bigfoot? And it's like, out of nowhere, I think he wanted to tell a fellow believer because he knew. He knew y'all would he knew. The tell everyone. Knew. <laughs> there's no better and way. He, I hope he only goes by the professor the from professor. now on. Yeah, yeah. If you're listening, 
and your dad or uncle or somebody has this had this interaction and is a professor, we want his perspective. Also, <laughs> yes. please write in. <laughs> please. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Liv. Sinister Hood will be right back. Well, this last one is from Lily, and the subject line is The White Bluff Screamer, My Town's Own Cryptid or Haunting? Hello, everyone. I love the show so much and have been trying to narrow down the perfect story to submit. After trying to narrow down the insane list from my haunted family farm I grew up on or my visit to the Stanley Hotel that truly changed how I view the paranormal, I decided to write about my hometown's own little cryptid, the White Bluff Screamer. I hope you enjoy it. I grew up on super old land in Middle Tennessee. My dad grew up here and would tell me stories about the supposed wolf man that would come in on trains every night and howl at the moon looking for his next victim. I had no idea until I was much older that the story on that one was from his imagination. The man has some storytelling skills. Tennessee is pretty well known for how haunted we are. From Bigfoot sightings in the Smokies to the infamous Bell Witch of Adams, Tennessee that scared every single person in my elementary school. This story, though, I'm about to tell you, originates in the small town of White Bluff. The details of the story change depending on who you're talking to, but the creature and its piercing screams remain the same. It's the 1920s in rural Tennessee, and the chill of fall is lingering in the air as Todd, no one knows his real name, so let's call him Todd for the story, Todd treks through the woods with his only guide being the slices of moonlight through the trees and the distant noise of a high-pitched scream that sounds eerily like a young girl, but is probably just a wounded animal. The noise has persisted the last few nights, and Todd and his family have gotten almost no sleep. His wife and their seven children are huddled up at the cabin while Todd is now determined to find out just what this noise is with his father's gun in his hand. Just as he climbs out of a hollow, the screaming stops. He had been so close. What happened? He tries to climb back down the hollow and trace his steps, when all of a sudden, the scream seems to be right where his home is. Only now, there isn't just one scream piercing the night. He races back to the cabin he and his family built, praying the thoughts couldn't be true. The screams couldn't be in the house. They just couldn't. Todd reaches the front door, and every ounce of oxygen he had escapes his lungs as his knees hit the wood where his love once roamed. His beautiful wife is in the corner, covered in blood, still trying to defend their children, but it is evident that they are all dead. Blood is all over the walls, and Todd races to his wife to ask what happened. She's barely hanging on, and the only words she gets out before succumbing to death are, The voice! The voice! It was the screams! It was her! She was here! Upon further inspection, Todd sees his poor family shredded to nothing in his home while he was gone, trying to protect them. This is the story that was always told as the origin of the Screamer. I tried to figure out more about what the Screamer is. Is it a person? Is it an animal-like cryptid? My town's website tells the story of a man who was on a camping trip with his family in the 1950s when they heard the screams, only to find huge cat-like paw prints in the mud. Other versions of the story describe Todd, after finding his family, going into the woods every night to try to find the voice. One night, he comes upon an ethereal female ghostly figure covered in white light. Her screams stop, and she floats away in blue flames, leaving fire in her wake. The stories all differ, but maybe we'll never know if the White Bluff Screamer is a cryptid-like monster or a woman in white who's haunting the woods. I've included some sources from my local news, town websites, and an illustration of the man running from the Screamer. Thanks so much for reading, even if it doesn't make it on the podcast. I love all the work you ladies do and how you encourage everyone to be their authentic self and do what makes them happy. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. much. That's so such a nice way to end that, Lily, from such a terrifying story. Yeah. The White Bluff Screamer. You go out to try and protect it and you get back and it's it took that opportunity when you left to attack. It was watching. It was was watching oh yeah tennessee woods get me they're spooky scary appalachian kind of woods where mm-hmm. my tennessee hill people family is at uh and screaming the bell witch story yes we yeah that is an eerie one cover that one on the show at a live show we did that was a super fun one that i imagine really though if you grow up in that area it's not the most fun story no. to hear 
this link that Lily sent of an artist rendering of the screamer. There's some, I, I don't like wispy like things with long fingers and claws. Like you just can't, you can't grab it. Your, mm -hmm. If you tried to grab it, your hands would just go right through it. Yeah, where it's like something that's evil enough that can hurt you, but when you try to go strike back, you're mm -hmm. like grabbing, you know, you're throwing punches underwater, or, you know, you're grasping at smoke wisps, essentially. But yeah. something about the idea of like the dark quietness of a forest and just being cut through by a sharp scream is yeah. so eerie. And to think yeah. that... <laughs> any time, you know, it's yeah. Any type of scream where you're like, that was an animal, and not a person, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so it's like I don't, I hope. Don't and even know if what it was it an animal, you're like, what made it scream like that? A yes. bigger animal, <laughs> a person, a huge mm -hmm. animal. But the giant cat paw prints. We may be looking at a wampus cat situation coming Ooh, up through where panther. That yeah, Were Panther, Wampus Cat, something like that coming up through the it's it's walks the Appalachian Trail from the, the deep south on up, but a big ass cat or uh a ghost in the woods, I'm not trying to meet either of those, honestly. No, no. It's like the bear and the man. I don't yeah. want either. <laughs> honestly. If I have to choose though between a ghost and a cat, a big cat. Yeah. Oof. Well, if it's a screamer, I think I'm going big cat. But if yeah, it's just like a regular ghost, I'll go ghost. Yeah, if it's a fun, friendly a Casper situation. I'm <laughs> yeah, fine we with. could have a fun time and a fun <laughs> romp through the woods. <laughs> yeah, a freaking forest ghost take you on like mm -hmm. a hike together. Uh, no, not a scary screaming ghost. I'm not about that. But that's a great question of these types of we, we often run into this and when we're researching to do an episode on like, say, when we did the Lady of the Lake, the Dallas based legend of like, there's 13 different, there's not mm -hmm. a story, you know, like we cover a trial, we can kind of go and go, okay, here's the transcript of that. But folklore like this, it's like, well, well, what is it? And it's like, it's the screamer. It's like, so it's like a lady or like a thing. It's like, you don't want to meet the strip screamer in the woods. It's like, <laughs> you're like, yes, I yes, but if I did. answer though, <laughs> indeed, but if to prepare myself, I need to know what it is precisely. That's why I ask so many questions. And they're like, by the time you ask questions, screamers got you. <laughs> it's too late. Well, it's too late. But that's what's interesting about storytelling and folklore is it just morphs and changes as the legend gets passed on. And, mm -hmm. It's uh, what starts off is like usually a cautionary tale to keep kids inside so they don't mm -hmm. go out and get into all sorts of trouble ends up becoming like this thing that's morphed into like the whole family was taken from this man. And now yes. like, what does he do? He walks the woods looking for this screamer. So now you got him and the screamer both in the woods. <laughs> yes. Now I don't get between him and vengeance. It's like, why well, mm -hmm. gotta, well, y'all have beef with each other. I have beef with <laughs> none of you. I'm just trying to hike. Can I just go, please? You can't. You gotta oh. pick a side. <laughs> <laughs> Choose a side. Go. Oh, I gotta go team guy. Cause I don't yeah. know until I know more information. The screamer's like, you don't know what he did to these woods. And then you're like, all right, maybe I'm team screamer. I don't know. <laughs> Yep. Um, yeah, we got to sit down and have like a, a mediation to find yeah. out like what is everybody's side here. There's three sides to every story: mm -hmm. the screamers, the mans, and something in between. That's probably the truth. Exactly. We gotta. We'll we'll get to the bottom of it for sure. But thank you so very much, Lily, for sending something like this in. This is the kind of stuff we like too. You know, where it's like a weird folklore that's just mm -hmm. only known. To, it's not weird to you because you grew up there, but like. It's such a cool, like, niche thing of where you're from. It's my favorite yeah. kind of story. So thank you. We had never heard of this one. So mm -hmm. we always love to hear about urban legends and lores like this. So thank you so much, Lily. And thank you to everybody for mm -hmm. sending in your Freaky Friday stories. If you have an odd but true story, maybe you've encountered Bigfoot. It seems like we're getting <laughs> some Bigfoot stories now. So they're coming. We, Don't everybody's hold out. Don't like, hold out. Everybody was a little worried to admit that you've seen Bigfoot. There's no shame in it. Get the it out. Open. Yeah. We're going to – now you have like a support group that yes. we can all – so far there's like four of you in it. <laughs> yes. But don't we worry. can get more. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Y'all can meet on Zoom. You can tell, <laughs> tell the story. Somebody get the, get a hold of the professor. Get his e .edu email. Yeah, get the professor on board. Well, maybe you've seen a UFO or you had a brush with true crime or you felt the presence of an otherworldly being. Send all those stories in to Sinisterhood.com slash Freaky Friday. And if you like our free episodes, you'll love our Patreon bonus content. You can join for free just to see what we're up to next. We send out 
alerts when we're doing something, going live, posting new content. And just for signing up for free, you also get archived bonus content once a month, which is super fun. You could also join at a tier and get up to like eight to 900 hours of bonus content. We have got so much. We have a full archive of all of our monthly live streams we've done. We got an archive of our live bonus content streams we've done. We have all of our weekly bonus content. We have brand new ones coming up for you this week. We're going to have an Am I the Asshole? We got a Judge Christie on deck. Uh, we have our monthly mini sodes. If you did not catch our recent one on Juggalos, we got a new one of those coming up for you in a few weeks. And merch discounts. Yeah. If you're ruling the airwaves or getting into it, you get a discount on merch. Just throw in that discount code whenever you go to check out, and it works even on clearance. And the best even part of Patreon, clearance. what's the best part? The community of the best listeners on the whole internet. It's true. It's and true. that is true. Y'all proved yeah. it. Y'all proved it here today. Sometimes if I'm feeling sad, I'll just go read comments people have left on the Facebook <laughs> group or on Patreon because that's where the nice comments are. I don't tremble into the other corners of the internet. <laughs> yeah, the whole internet sucks, but we've kept it a pretty – y'all, I say we, y'all have kept it a pretty good place over on the Patreon Facebook group. So join that. And if you want to use that merch discount, go over to SinisterHood.com and click shop on the top banner to check out our merch like t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, and even clothes for your kiddos in that Facebook group. We had such a cute picture shared of one of our listeners wearing a Believe and Be Kind matching with their little. So if you want to match with your so little cute. sweetie um, with our Flatwoods Monster design created by Christy's little. Little Ella, um, mm-hmm. go over to uh, sinisterhood.com and click shop on the top banner and don't miss our clearance merch as well. While you're on our website, you can also review the show. We make it super simple to give us a review. You can follow us on socials and check out the episode description. You'll also find fun things like topic-based playlists and links to all those full moon energy live shows. We'll see y'all this week in Chicago and Milwaukee. You can follow us on Instagram and threads at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. You can watch full video versions of our Wednesday episodes on YouTube. They drop early and ad-free on Patreon. But YouTube and TikTok are also where we go live sometimes, where we post clips from the show, clips from the live streams, clips from this and that. So if you want to see video versions of us, make sure you head over to YouTube and TikTok. And if you want videos of us for yourself, head over to Cameo.com and order a custom video shout that out. That sounded sexual, but we've Just not done any sexual us. cameos yet. Not well, you know what? You can put anything you want in that request box and we'll <laughs> see if whether we'll do it or not. What I say, you I got to put a horse anything head. you want. Yeah. Lady and a horse head. I'm ready. I got my Lucifer head. No one's asked to see it yet, but I have it at cameo.com. Order a custom video message from us today. Christy, where are you at on the internet? I am on Instagram and threads at Christy M. Wallace and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Uh, Lady Horsehead, where I'm are all- you? Um, it's, it used to be at Heather versus the world, but now it's just a uh, lady body horse head on all <laughs> platforms. <laughs> As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. <laughs> I thought that might make you laugh. <laughs>shy away from the full-on facial expression either it was like a (laughs) motorboat